And everybody said, Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. Away somewhere. Why didn't they put you in front? God bless you. Let me see your hands there. I know it had one hands. You know, some people are joining youth ministry because they are not, their hands have been anointed. Our adult uh, workers and leaders and pastors and um, prospective overseers. Where are you? God bless you. God bless your wives. Bless your children. Bless your families. Make you stronger than the GS. Praise the Lord. Our language, people, I know they don't want me to see your face, but I can hear your voice. Our language, people, our Yoruba Shawambe. God bless every one of you. The Igbo people, I don't know how to speak uh, much, but no. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. We're here tonight again. Amen. Happy people, Amen. joyful people, Amen. prospering people. Amen. Every area of your life is blessed. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name tonight, we bless your name. We thank you for the joy of the Lord. All these workers always coming together. And every time we come together, there is joy. There is happiness. Because we belong to the same Father. And we belong to the same vineyard of the Lord. Lord, we are praying today. Open our eyes to see more in your word in Jesus' name. Bless everybody without exception. Our children, church workers, bless them. Our youth leaders, bless them. Our campus brethren, bless them. Language people, bless them. Our daddies and mommies, fathers and mothers, pastors and leaders, bless everyone in Jesus' name. And use us to be a blessing to your church and a blessing to our community and the world. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see now we're looking at Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21 and we're reading from verse 1 Exodus chapter 21 verse 1 now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them if thou buy an Hebrew slave Hebrew servant six years shall he serve and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing if he came in by himself he shall go out by himself if he came in, if he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Verse 5, And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve, his, he shall serve him how long? Forever. Tonight we're looking at this passage. It's an Old Testament passage and it's full of meaning, very rich indeed. And uh, somebody might say, why are we studying that? We're looking at Romans in the New Testament, Romans chapter 15. We're reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 15, we're reading from verse 4. It tells us in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It's talking to the whole church and it's saying those things that were written at all time in the Old Testament, they're written for our learning, they're written for our instruction, so that those of us now who have become saved and those of us who are called into the ministry, it says because of this Old Testament passage will have, uh, will have patience and comfort through 
that we also have hope. Even though it says all things that were reaching in the Old Testament, particularly the passage we're looking at today, look at it now, Romans chapter 15 verse 1. It says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. It's calling us to service. And it's saying that as a servant we are strong, as a person that is a winning souls who are strong, as a leader and as a minister in the household of faith, we are strong. It says those of us who are strong, we need to bear the infirmities of the people who are weak and not to please ourselves. We need to bend down and carry the load for other people. The people that are finding life difficult and challenging for them, we need to give a helping hand. It says in verse 2, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. It's calling us to a time of service and it's calling us to a life of service. And it says in that service, we must please our neighbor. He needs salvation, give him the word of salvation. He needs help, give him help. And be a servant for everyone. For even Christ, please not himself, is telling us the perfect one that came to save that came to serve and he says i'm among you as one that serveth even christ please not himself as it is written the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me as we are serving there might be persecution a little bit of uh, discomfort a little bit of insult a little bit of assault a little bit of misunderstanding but it says Christ bore everything so that he can grant us and give us salvation free and full. He says now, if we're serving and we have this challenge, that's all right. We're following after Christ, following after the example of Christ, and the reward that he has promised will be ours in Jesus' name. It's as he talks about service, and he talks about submission. And it talks about suffering, if need be. When we're serving the Lord, then it says in verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written upon them. It says, that word for me is because, it says, you must serve. Serve with the mind of Christ. You must serve. Serve your neighbors. You must serve. Go to your neighbors and be the best for everyone. It says, because what things soever were reaching aforetime, they were reaching for our learning upon whom the ends of the world are come now, and we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. With that understanding, come back now to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, it says, If thou buy an Hebrew slave, an Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve. And in the seventh, he shall go out free. Tell me the next word there. For nothing. For nothing. That is, he comes to the master. And the master has made use of his services for six years. In the year of Jubilee, is the year of deliverance, in the year of liberty, is the year of releasing those slaves and those servants. If he wants to go, you'll grant him the liberty, but he'll go out with nothing. I want to remind you that our life on earth is a period of probation, a period of preparation for heaven. It's a period of service. You are born into this world so you can serve. You are born into the kingdom so you can serve. And you are converted by the Lord himself so that you can serve. You are consecrated, you are committed, you learn the word of God so that you can serve him better. Our time on earth, our experience on earth, our existence on earth is a time of serving. We are created to serve. We are converted to serve. We are commanded to serve. We are commissioned to serve. We are commended only when we serve. We are condemned for not serving. We'll be crouched eventually because of service. You cannot say, well, I was born again, but I wasn't a worker. Why were you not a worker? I was converted, but I was not committed to the work of the Lord. Why not? I was a child of God, but I was not a Libra in the kingdom of God. But why not? Because you're going to be crowned eventually. 
because of what you have done in the kingdom of God. You're going to be crowned, commended, and you're going to be rewarded eventually because of what you have done in the kingdom for the king and for the citizens of his kingdom. That's the reason why you want to understand how much are you serving God now? How much of a servant of God, how much of a steward of God are you today? Serving in a good serving a good master in a good cause as us the profit of service. This is a good cause. So winning is a good cause. This is a good cause. Serving the Lord to build the church for Christ with Christ. That's a good cause. And when you serve a good master and you serve in a good cause, that earns you the profit of service. Serving an evil master in a worthless enterprise brings the pain of suffering brings the peril of suffering brings the punishment of suffering that's why you need to consider the work you are rendering in the kingdom and the work and the life you are rendering you are living here in the world are you serving the good master or are you serving an evil master you cannot do both together you either serve one or the other in matthew chapter 6 jesus christ himself emphasized in verse 24 in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. Do you understand that? It's saying, for example, one master is going this direction, the other master is going the other direction. You can only follow one. You can only serve one. You cannot serve a good master and an evil master at the same time. This master is good. This master is gracious. This master is generous. This other master is cruel, is wicked, is violent. And then you want to serve, you cannot serve the good and the evil at the same time. No man can serve true masters. You cannot serve the godly and the worldly at the same time. Here is a master, is godly, his thoughts of heaven. His thoughts are the things that are godly. His thoughts are things that will uplift people's lives. This sort of master is worldly. All he's thinking about is the world. All he's thinking about is sand and cement. You cannot serve the godly and the worldly at the same time. No man can serve two masters, the pure and the perverse. This master is pure. His thoughts are pure. His vision is pure. His goal is pure. His aspiration is pure. Even his attitude is pure. You want to serve him? Serve him. This other one is perverse. This other one is impure. No man can serve two masters at the same time. The pure and the impure. The pure and the perverse. No man can serve two masters. No one can serve the progressive and the retrogressive. The progressive and the preventive. Here is a master, he is visionary. Here is a master, he is upward looking. Here is a master, he is forward going. Here is a master, he is always on the move, he is always on the go. Here is another master, he is retrogressive. Here is another master, he is drawing back. Here is another master, he is dull, he is dead, he is a dead wood. And he cannot move. It's not, it doesn't have any intention to move. And you want to serve. You cannot serve the progressive as well as the retrogressive at the same time. No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve the self-effacing and the self-exalting at the same time. This one is self-effacing. He doesn't want you to see him. He wants only to see Christ and to see the glory of God and to see the majesty of God. That's all he wants. This other one is self-exalting. Anything he does, he wants to attract attention to himself. You cannot serve the self-effacing master and the self-exalting master at the same time. No man can serve two masters, the visionary and the short-sighted. You see, there are leaders, there are masters that are visionary. 
and they're looking at the peak of the mountain. They're looking at the top of the mountain. They're looking at what can I do next? What can I do next? How can I bless a life there? Bless another life there? How can I reach that one there? How can I make somebody sad somewhere? Make him happy. He's visionary. This other one is short-sighted. He doesn't see beyond his nose. If you're going to serve this master, serve him. If you're going to serve this master, serve him. You cannot serve those two masters at the same time. No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve the heavenly and the hellish at the same time. This other master is heavenly. His goal is heaven. His vision is heaven. His passion is heaven. He wants to get to heaven. He's heavenly minded. And he wants to take as many people as possible to heaven. This other master is hellish. It's for hell. It says, if we don't go to hell, who else will be in hell? Hell will be so lonely if, you know, people don't go there. He doesn't care whether he himself gets to hell or not. Whether he gets to heaven or not. It says, if God wants to get me to heaven, that's his choice. He'll do it. But I don't have anything to contribute to that. And if those people want to go to hell, say, let them go. Why are you going to, you know, knock your head on the wall and then go through the bush of thorns and go through the uncharted path so as to rescue people from hell? He is hellish. But you are heavenly. And your master is heavenly. No man can serve two masters at the same time. You either follow this or follow that. And that's why we we'll want to talk tonight on serving the best of masters. Serving the best of masters. There are many kinds of masters in the world. There are many kinds of masters that want to lay claim to your life. And they want, to, uh, they want you to serve them. They want to lay claim to your talent, to your skill, to your ability, to your treasures, to your knowledge, and to your time, and to everything you have. They want to say, serve me. But you want to understand, who do you want to serve? Serving the best of masters. We're coming back to Exodus and I'm reading here from verse 2. There are three points we're considering tonight. Number one, the purchase of a common slave. The purchase of a common slave. Point number two, the pattern for all committed servants. The pattern for all committed servants. Point number three, the permanence of consecrated service. The permanence of consecrated service number one i'm sure you've written number one what did you write wonderful the purchase of a common slave we're coming to exodus chapter 21 the first part of verse 2 exodus chapter 21 the first part of verse 2 it says if thou buy an hebrew slave stop right there for a moment if thou buy an hebrew slave the purchase of a common slave. You see, the Lord was telling them this, not only a picture of an Hebrew slave, but a picture of themselves. He talks about a purchase. He talks about buying. He talks about paying a price to buy a slave. And then he uses that word many times to to buy, to buy, because he bought them, he bought them. Deuteronomy chapter 32. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, we're reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we're reading from verse 6. It says, Do ye thus require the Lord, O foolish people, and unwise? Is he not thy father that has bought thee? You buy an Hebrew slave. The Lord has bought you. The Lord has purchased you. And the Lord paid a great price that he bought you. He bought you. And then he says, As he not made thee an established deed. Look at verse 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the Lord of his inheritance. He found him in a desert, in a desert land, and in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Here is a master that loved the people he bought, the people he purchased were coming to Psalm 74. 
Psalm 74, we're reading from verse 2. Psalm 74, reading from verse 2. And you see the situation, the condition of the children of Israel. The Lord had bought them. The Lord paid a price for their purchase. Here it tells us, Psalm 74, reading from verse 2. Remember thy congregation. It's talking about the whole lot of them now. The whole congregation, the people of God, the children of Israel. Remember thy congregation, which thou hast Tell me the word. Purchase of old. Purchase of old. That is, if thou buy an Hebrew slave, because I bought you to, I purchased you to, I paid the price on you to, and see the kind of master I am, and look at the kind of master you ought to be, and you who are servants, if, if, if somebody has bought you and purchased you, now you must serve him like the whole nation of Israel must serve me. And even when it says you can go, even when he says he releases you, you want to show that you are committed to this master, a loving master, a generous master, a compassionate master, and a giving master that has given you everything that you need. And so he says, remember thy congregation which thou hast purchased to fold, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed. He says, they are purchased, he says, they are redeemed, this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. You see, as uh, the Old Testament people were told that they were bought, they were purchased, even those of us in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, were bought, were purchased as well. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, verse 20, watch. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and ye are not your own? Ye are not your own. It says, for ye are, tell me, tell me out loud, for ye are bought with a price. Ye are bought with a price. It's telling us that we are bought with a price, and therefore it says, therefore, because you are bought, because you are purchased, because you are redeemed, just like that man, the master in the Old Testament, purchased a Hebrew slave, a common slave, and now he has bought us because of that. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Chapter 7, chapter 7 of uh, 1 Corinthians, and I'm reading from verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse, tell me. 23 yeah what's the word there bought with a price you see how it tells us over and over you must never forget you must never forget that you are a slave but now you are bought you are purchased a sinful slave that's who you are you were a subjected slave. You see, those children of Israel, the Egyptians and Pharaoh subjected them to servitude. And that's what they were. And now God came and he bought them. And we were, were subjected slaves, slaves to sin, and slaves to the devil, and slaves to society. And now the Lord had mercy on us and he has purchased us. They were suffering slaves. That's why God said, Their cry is come unto me. I've heard they are groaning. I've heard their cry because they are suffering in the land of Egypt. That's what we were. We were suffering. All kinds of ailments. Some ailments uh, doctors could not even discover. X-ray could not even discover. We were suffering people and yet Christ has come to purchase us. Think about those uh, children of Israel. They were deprived. Deprived. Even though they served and they built and they did everything for Pharaoh and for Egypt, yet they were deprived. They didn't have their rights. They didn't have their rights. And the taskmasters were behind them, beating them and whipping them. You have not fulfilled the task of today. Were we not deprived in life before we came to know the Lord? We walked and we sweated a lot. But what did we get? And we moved here and there, looking for greener pastures every time. What did we get? What deprived people? You see, those children of Israel, before, before Moses came when he said, let my people go. They were hopeless slaves. Hopeless slaves. And Pharaoh said, what are you talking about? They will serve me forever. And then Moses went again. He said, don't come here again. And then he increased their task. Hopeless slaves. What were we when we were without Christ? 
without salvation, without God, and without any good thing, and without the hope of heaven, we were hopeless slaves. They were hell-bound slaves. Because the blood of the Lamb had not been shed for them. They served and served. And if they died like that, they died the sinner's death. What were you? Where were you going? Before Jesus Christ sought you. Before he found you. And before he purchased you and he bought you. You were hell bent and hell bound. They were perpetual slaves. Perpetual slaves. From generation to generation. Do you know how many years they spent in Egypt? 430 years. And generation after generation after generation they were there joseph was gone and all the people that followed joseph they were gone and these people were in sleep perpetually there in egypt before god found them and bought them what were we perpetual slaves you know we tried and tried what could we get without the strength of god and without the grace of god we were helpless slaves those people they were helpless slaves the only one that could help them i tried to help them in the wrong way and then he said who made you a judge over us you want to kill me like you killed those, that egyptian yesterday and when moses knew that he ran away now they were they were left in helplessness what did we have who could help us who could deliver us from the enemy that is stronger than we are, from Satan, from those evil spirits and those evil powers, before Christ met us? They were worthless slaves. Worthless slaves. You know what? Pharaoh did not put any value on them. If anyone died, he just died. In fact, he gave power to those tax masters. They could do anything with them and they could beat them to death and Pharaoh cared not. What were we? Were worthless before Christ found us? A salvation that puts value on us. It's eternal life we have. That's what puts value on us. We're worthless people. They were unprofitable. Unprofitable. And Pharaoh just got rid of them because there were so many. If you are not there, they'll say, there'll be people that will be my pyramid for me, that will do this and that. But each of them was unprofitable in a way. And what were we? Unprofitable to ourselves. Unprofitable to our families. Unprofitable in the kingdom of God. Unprofitable to heaven. Before Christ made us we were slaves and now praise the lord the one that had no value he has put value on you that had no worth he has put worth on you or self-destructive slaves self-destructive slaves uh, can you imagine even though those egyptians were oppressing them they were still rejecting one another that's why they rejected moses and they were destroying themselves oppressed people and self-destructive people that's what we were before christ met us why if not for christ that has purchased us maybe you'll still be in the beer pardon maybe you'll still be drinking all your money away you get the money like this you go to spend it on something worthless but thank god i am purchased I said, thank God I'm purchased. And now that you are purchased, you know what he has done? He has paid a great price for that purchase. A great price he has paid. He has saved us. He has forgiven us. He has set us free. Not only that, he has converted us. That means he has changed us. That means he has transformed us. We're no more slaves. We're sons and daughters of God. He has now even adopted us into the family, into his own family. Have you found anybody doing like that before? Even if they loved the slave, his slave was still a slave. Even if they loved an employee, is still an employee, is still an employee. Even if they loved uh, somebody who was serving them, a steward, a steward was still a steward. But now God has purchased us and he has adopted us into his family. We have become, number one, a saved soul. Am I talking to a saved soul tonight? We have become a saved soul. Number two, you become a serving son. A servant yet, but now uh, your kind of service is different because you are a serving son. Thank God, number three, you are now a submissive servant. A submissive servant. When you come to church now, you remember, you remember, before you were born again, daddy said, everybody get ready. 
Good, you are going to church. We are going to church again today. You were not happy when they said, oh, let us go into the house of the Lord. Every time they woke up in the family, five o'clock, I don't know your family, maybe they rang the bell. Maybe they did something. Everybody get up and they're going to read the Bible and the sleep was still there, you know, kind of drawing you away and you are grumbling inside you that, you know, this uh, father, what kind of father is this? Everybody must read the Bible now. But then you became born again. I'm talking to somebody who became born again. Yes. Somebody, are you born again? Yes. Now you became born again. And reading the Bible, uh, that's no hardship anymore. You love it. Serving the Lord, you love it. Because now you are a submissive servant. You are now a sanctified steward. A sanctified steward. It's not like, you know, you were serving the Lord before. Now you are bought, you are purchased. And because you are bought, that same blood that bought you has also cleansed you, put you, sanctified you. You are now a steadfast soul winner. A steadfast soul winner. That's a great assumption I'm making. I'm assuming that you are a soul winner. I said I'm assuming that you are a soul winner. I, I see people not dropping their head and looking at their paper. They don't want me to look at their faces to discover they are not soul winners. But I'm going to look at you. You are now a soul winner. And then there's somebody you are winning to. They love because the joy of... I won his soul to the Lord. I brought that person to the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. And that person said, hey, when, can I wait for you? So you take me to church on Sunday. And the joy of serving the Lord as a soul winner will never die away from your life in Jesus' name. You are a steady sower. The sower went forth to sow the seed of the word of God. And you are steady about it. You are sowing the seed here. You are sowing the seed here. You are sowing the seed here. And you are shining saint in the, in the grace of God and by the name of the Lord in Jesus name. The Lord has paid a great price and that great price has brought us into the kingdom. We're looking at 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1 1 Peter chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 reading from verse 18. The price by which we're brought into the kingdom for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from by tradition from your fathers but what they tell me the price that purchased you what's the price the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot and I pray that uh, you give glory to God and your life will be giving uh, service to God because you are bought in Jesus' name. I'm coming to Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Titus chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 14. In Titus chapter 2 verse 14, it says who gave himself for us. That's the price he paid. That's the price he paid. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. What kind of people? I said what kind of people? A peculiar people. What happens to them? Zealous of good works. Look up for a moment, you know. When people look at you, do they see you as peculiar? Think about that honestly and seriously. Transparently. Think about that. When other believers see you, other believers in other congregations, other churches, other denominations, when they see your zeal, when they see your passion, when you see the drive, when they see how you reach out to souls, do they see you as peculiar? Are you satisfied with Praise the Lord, I'm a believer, and I'm going to heaven, I'm a church goer, I'm even a worker in Nepal life. Does the title carry the responsibility? Do they see you that look at this man, he works in the work of God more than the people that work in the factory, in the world. He works more than the teachers that teach in our primary and secondary schools. He works more than the employees of any employment here in our country. You look at him, it's not on full time. It's not on full time, but you'll think that's a full time pastor. 
You'll see it's a full-time evangelist. You'll see that he has nothing he's thinking about. He wakes up in the morning and before he goes to work, he's announcing to everybody that Jesus Christ is Savior. And the, the people that are, you know, in their communities, it's the, that's the first voice they hear in the morning, in their morning cry, Jesus is Savior. They say, I know that voice. I know that voice. I don't think I know him by face, but that's a peculiar man. That's a peculiar woman. And you get your place of work, anybody you're interacting with, after you've done the official thing and everything is settled, you're saying, you know, by the way, by the way, it's good. All this transaction is good. There's another transaction that is very important because if we don't have that other transaction, this transaction will finish here on earth. You're peculiar. You take everything, you move everything, you kind of direct everything, divert everything to talking about heaven and talking about Jesus Christ and that man in his heart, he says, this man is peculiar. When I come next time, uh, he's going to talk about this again until I surrender. And if he comes to the office and he doesn't see you there, he's disappointed, he's lingering, he's saying, where is pastor? Where is pastor? Because that's what he, he knows you to be and thank God you are pastor. Lady pastor. Yeah. I can't hear my daughters. Yeah. And real, real men, pastors and ministers. Yeah. You know, he say where is pastor? And then when you show, maybe you went, uh, you know, to buy some, you came back. He said, uh, you know, I came to do transaction today. And I didn't say, I thought maybe what happened to you? And then you say, praise the Lord, you are waiting for me. I wish you wait for Christ like that. I wish you get ready because Christ is also coming so that if you wait for, if you are born again, if you are saved, he said, that's what I was waiting for. I knew you will say that you are peculiar. You are peculiar. And anywhere you go, whatever is happening, if there's news, if there are current affairs, if there's anything, you look at that and you turn everything in the direction of preaching the gospel because the Lord has saved us and the Lord has redeemed us and now we are peculiar people. Peculiar people, are they there tonight? Yeah. The Lord will put a stamp of peculiarity on your life in Jesus' name. And then he talks about zealous, zealous of good works. You know, the average servant, the average slave, the average worker, the average employee over there in the world, the due lip service and eye service. If the master is coming, everybody gets up and they're doing something, they're pushing something, they're working. When it's not there, they said, I'm not going to walk and die on the job. After all, how much are they paying me? I'm not going to walk my fingers to the bone. I'm not going to die before my time. Therefore, I'm not going to do this. But those who are working for the master, you are working and serving the best of masters. Because Jesus is the best master you can ever find. And because he's the best of masters, whether we are there or not, you are doing it. You are winning souls. You are preaching the gospel. Whether they praise you or blame you, it doesn't matter to you at all. You know that this is one thing I'm living for and you are living for that and the Lord will reward you on the final day in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. The pattern for all committed servants. The pattern for all committed servants. What pattern do we see here? We're coming back to uh, Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 2. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and in the seventh year he shall go out free. Tell me the last two words. For nothing. For nothing. He wants to go. He will go, but he will go he will go for nothing. It says in verse 3, if he came in by himself, that is when he came in to be a servant, no wife, no children, no property, no house, nothing. He will go out by himself. He shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If he were married before he came in and so himself, and the wife became slaves together in that, under that same master. Then both of them will go out free, but with nothing. Look at verse 4. If his master have given him a wife, and have borne him children, sons and daughters, the wife and, the, and her children shall be, tell me, her masters, and he shall go out, tell me, by himself. Think about that. Here is a Hebrew slave, a common slave. Here is a, an Hebrew slave, an ordinary slave. The master gave him wife. 
the master gave him uh, property. And now that wife had born children for him. At the sixth year, he says, thank God there's freedom. Thank God we don't have to stay here forever and ever. Thank God we're leaving now. And the master said, you want to leave? That's all right. You can leave. But remember, I gave you the wife. Remember, these children came from the wife. I gave you. You want to go? You go out empty-handed. You go out for nothing. You go out with nothing. Uh, can you think about your life? We had nothing when the master found us and bought us. We had nothing of eternal value. Nothing of eternal profit. Just like Hebrews. The Hebrew servants, they had nothing you know, under Pharaoh, under Egypt. They were common slaves and they were accounted as nothing. We were slaves, slaves to Satan, slaves to sin, and slaves to sensuality, and slaves to society. We had nothing. We were nothing. We were counted as nothing. If we leave the master, put it simply, if we leave Jesus Christ, put it simply, if we leave the Savior, put it another way, if we leave the Redeemer, if we leave the one that paid such a price for us, and we say, I'm leaving the master, I'm leaving the Savior, I'm leaving the Redeemer, we leave with nothing. We came in with nothing, we leave with nothing. And not only that, we leave the service with nothing, we leave this world to go to eternity with nothing. Can you imagine yourself? You come to the edge and the brink of eternity, and you are to enter eternity. You don't even have any clothes on. The garment of righteousness is not there. You go with nothing, naked. You go with nothing, no grace. You go with nothing, no acceptance. You go with nothing, no approval. You go with nothing, no recognition. You go with nothing, no help. You go with nothing, no key to open the door to heaven. Because you say, I want to be free. I want to be by myself. I want to go out free. But if you love the master, if you say, I love him. I love the wife he gave me. I love the grace he gave me. I love the freedom he gave me. I love the peace of mind he gave me. I love the resources he gave me. I love the privilege and chance he gave me. I will not go free. I will abide with him. All he has given you will abide with you. And then they will multiply. You go from joy to joy. And from grace to grace, and from inheritance to inheritance, in Jesus' name. Uh, come, come back uh, to this uh, passage. It says uh, he will go out for nothing. In verse 3, he goes out by himself. In verse 4, he goes out by himself. We're coming to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And I'm reading from verses 15 and 16. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. As he came forth out of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And shall take, tell me, tell me out loud, nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. That is a person who says, I'm leaving the best of masters. I'm leaving the redeemer. I'm leaving the savior. And then he's going to work for the things of the world. He says, I need more time. I need more time for brick and mortar in the world. I need more time for certificates in the world. I need more time for the work and the employment of the world. I need more time for traveling and sightseeing here and there. It says, okay, if you do like that and you leave the work of the Lord, it says when you are going to die, you go as nothing, with nothing and accounted as nothing. I will not do that. That will not happen to me. When I go out of this world, I want to go out with fullness of joy. I want to go out with grace. I want to go out with his power. I want to go out with assurance. I want to go out with the inheritance of the kingdom. Very sure that in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive. Tell me your name. 
I receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. That person is not going out with nothing. It's going out with confidence that I belong to the Lord. And eternity of heaven also belongs to me. It will happen in Jesus' name. Look at verse 16, verse 16. And this also is a so evil that in all points, in all points, in all points, as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he that has labored for the wind? What profit? A person that came to this world and then he goes away with nothing. And let's look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21. We're coming to verse 3. John chapter 21 verse 3. Simon Peter says unto them, I go a fishing. Peter, what are you doing? Well, I want to leave the service. Peter, what's happening to you? I want to leave this uh, soul winning. I want to leave this uh, ministry. I want to leave uh, this working for God, working for God, and laboring here, laboring there. I, I promised the Lord I was going to die with him. And then a lady came to me and said, you are one of them. I became so afraid. I said, no. And since I cannot hold out or hold on, I'm going back to my fishing. Remember, remember, when you go away from the master, the best of masters, you are going out by yourself and you're going out with nothing and you remember your story peter before christ met you we have toiled all the night and we caught tell me nothing. tell me out loud nothing. you had nothing when you came in and then you've been with the lord now and look at it you've walked on the waters look at it you've joined other people two by two and you have gone out to preach repentance and then miracles have followed your ministry because they returned and they said even the devils are a kind of a submissive unto us but now he says I want to go back to fishing. Are you going back? I said are you going back? How do you spend your time today? What do you spend your time on today? I don't have any time again. You don't have any time to be a coordinator. Something greater is coming. You are going to be a pastor. You don't, if you don't have time for this, are you going to have time for that? You are a pastor. Are you going to have an additional work of being an evangelist? If you don't have time for being a pastor now, are you going to be, have the time for pastor and evangelist? Am I talking to somebody? It says you are going to be my mouthpiece. And if you don't have time for, you know, the one-on-one -on -one witnessing now, are you going to have time to speak to 1,000 people, 2,000 people, and 20,000 people? Because I see you standing like Peter, and then declaring the word of God, and thousands of people are coming to the Lord in Jesus' name. But you know, before the day of Pentecost, it became so discouraged. You said, I go a fishing. This will not happen to you. And then they, they say unto him, we also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night, tell me now, tell me out loud. Well, you understand, nobody is putting any curse on you. But you know what happened before? You caught nothing. That's what's going to happen again. If you say, I go back a fishing, you catch nothing. You've done well now. You've come in. Stay. You've done well, you're serving the Lord, stay. You've done well, you're preaching the gospel, abide. You have done well and the work of God is prospering in your hand, stay, abide. Continue, I will continue. I said, I will continue. If you are tired, he'll give you strength. My grace is sufficient for you. If, you. if you are facing persecution, he will stop the mouth of the persecutors. And they will cut off all everything they are trying to do against your life in Jesus' name. If there is any pressure, any pressure, he is the one. He'll come and lift your pressure in Jesus' name. And if there's any sickness there, it's the great physician. He will heal the sickness of your body in Jesus' name. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm preaching the gospel. I don't have any child yet. Is that something to worry about? Miracle children will come to you in Jesus' name. I'm preaching the gospel. I don't have this. I don't have this. Seek ye for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And how many things now? Tell me out loud. If you believe it's coming your way, all this things shall be added unto you. I see the channel of blessing pointing your direction. And it is going to be poured out upon you in Jesus' name. Nothing to be discouraged about. Even if you are backsliding like Peter, 
go to the Lord because after the resurrection, Jesus said, go tell my disciples and Peter. He mentioned Peter. He forgave him, he will forgive you. Yeah. Don't quit, don't quit. Quitters never win and winners never quit. I will not quit. Because you see, the people who quit, the people who live, they live with nothing and they live by themselves. And then, uh, look at verse 4, but when uh, the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Uh, they have been with him for three years now, but after they left, they couldn't recognize him anymore. They couldn't see him anymore. They couldn't see the gracious one. They couldn't see the compassionate one. They couldn't see the only begotten son of God. They couldn't recognize him. How do you want to live your life now? You cannot recognize God anymore. You cannot recognize the Redeemer anymore. You cannot recognize and hear his voice anymore. And you cannot see his face and behold him and see his glory anymore. You don't want to come to the city situation like that where you don't have any inspiration, you don't have any revelation, you don't have any understanding, you don't have any skill, you don't have any power, you don't have any knowledge anymore. You cannot even recognize him. And Jesus says unto them, children, have ye any meat? Tell me. Verse 5, have ye any meat? They answered him, no, no meat again, no sustainers again. Leaving the Lord and leaving the work of God will bring us to nothingness. I pray you will not be like that in Jesus' name. And then Jesus now told them to throw their net when he comes back to our lives. And we come back fully to him. We're going to receive abundance in Jesus' name. Look at verse 15. Verse 15, it says, Jesus says uh, unto him, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? The same question is coming to us now. What are you getting back to? What are you going back to? Lovest thou me more than these, more than anything on earth? He says, he says unto him, Ye Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then he says unto him, tell me out loud, feed my lamb. If you love him, show it. If you love him, abide in his service. If you love him, continue in his service. Look at verse 16. He says unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Tell me the answer now. He says unto him, Feed my sheep. And verse 17, he says unto him, Now the third time, Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him, The third time, Lovest thou me? And he says unto him, Lord, that knowest all things. That knowest all things. Can you tell the Lord in your heart today that in every corner of your heart, every thought of your heart, every passion of your heart, every desire of your heart, every, every direction of your life, everything that is inside you, every thought and every plan, even your secret thoughts, can you tell the Lord that knowest all things? You know what I think? You know what I desire? You know what my passion is? You know where my direction is? And you know what actually makes me happy? You know what I'm looking for? That knowest all things? That knowest that I love thee? Jesus says unto him, tell me out aloud, feed my sheep. That's what he's telling you. If you say you love him, and if you say you are going to abide in his service, it says, then feed my sheep. Things will happen that will make you to feel, do I want to continue or do I want to stop? Look at Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. Ruth chapter 1, verse 15. And she says, behold, the sister-in-law is gone back unto our people, and uh, unto our gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee. Is that your language? Is that your decision? Is that your consecration? I can barely hear the yes. I pray that Ruth's decision will be the decision of the righteous here today. Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And with that thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die. There will I be buried. 
the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. She had made up her mind like you have made up your mind. But you know why he made up his mind like that? She made up her mind like that. Look at uh, chapter 4. Chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 15. Chapter 4, verse 15. He and he that and he shall be unto thee a restorer of life. And a nourisher of thine old age for thy daughter-in-law. Look at this. Thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee. And which is better to thee than seven sons has born him. They were talking about Ruth. The love that Ruth had for Naomi. The reason why she said, entreat me not to leave thee. The woman had lost her husband. She was a young widow. No husband. No child. And now there's not going to be any family. She was going to be cut away from her people. Like our people are complaining. Ah, ah, what's happening to you? Every time we want to see you, we cannot even see you. They say you've gone for evangelism. What kind of life is this? They say you've gone to church. What kind of uh, life is this? And they say you've gone for training. So what, what kind of life is this? They say that, you know, if you come at this time on Monday, this is timetable. On Tuesday, that's our timetable. On uh, Wednesday, this is a timetable. On Thursday, this is a timetable. On Friday, they are going for this. On Saturday in the morning, this is what they do. On Saturday evening, this is what they do. Sunday, of course. This is what they do. And then from there, they go here. They say, what kind of life is that? That's a peculiar life. I said it's a peculiar life. You know what they want to do? They want to cut the peculiarity away from your life. They say, be like us. We are not like that. Are you not part of our family? What's happening to you? You're so peculiar. And you're so different. That's how you're going to be peculiar in heaven. And when they see all the crowd like it like that of many stars in your head they said we knew we knew he was peculiar on earth and now we get to heaven is peculiar and you can tell when i get to heaven i will be peculiar i said when i get to heaven i'll be peculiar when you get to heaven you'll be peculiar in jesus name you see this Ruth, this Ruth, she loved Naomi more than seven sons. And everybody knew. And he said, this is a peculiar woman. If a woman does not have a child, she will not do anything. She will pull her hand and she will be crying all the day long. And she said, I don't have a husband. I don't have any child. But this one, her love is more than the love of somebody that has seven sons. The way she loved you. If you love the Lord like that, nothing will ever bother you. And you'll be zealous of good works serving the Lord because you love the Lord. I pray it will be like that in your life in Jesus' name. You'll be, number one, a loving servant. Loving servant. Because I love my master and I will not go. Therefore, you are a loving servant. You'll be a laboring servant. You cannot say I love and you don't labor. You love him. You, 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 you labor for him. And you are living for him. You'll be a listening servant. This is what my master wants done. This is where he wants me to go. And I'm a listening servant. You'll be a learning servant. Lord, we've done this. What next? Lord, we've done this. What mom lord we've done this where else do we go you'll be an obedient servant obedient servant because you love him you want to give him total obedience you'll be a productive servant because if we have people like you in the whole service of the lord you're so productive you're so profitable and then you're so fruitful and if everybody was bearing fruit like you the kingdom of god will be full to overflowing it's going to happen in jesus Jesus name. You'll be an example to other people. You'll be a pattern to other people. You'll be an inspiration to other people as you're serving the Lord. You'll be a sacrificial servant. A sacrificial servant. You know, a servant who really loves does not say, I've done this full stop. I cannot go beyond that point. I'm tired now. Let another person pick it up. I've done, I've gone this far full stop. I cannot go beyond that now. Let another person pick that up. Your sacrifice, your sacrifice, even when you are tired, even when you are weary, you say, Lord, I need more grace and more grace will come. 
I need more strength and more strength will come. And then you will be a consistent servant. A consistent servant. There are people that serve for one month when the revival is just starting and the fire is burning and then everybody is at it. They say, yes, we can do it. Yes, we can do it. We're going to win the whole city. We're going to win the whole community unto the Lord. And we're going to have this gospel planted in every house. Then after one month, the fire dies down. And we say, brother, you remember what you said? <laughs> I said that, but you know, now I see the reality of the day. I see that, you know, if you are running and running and running, you always get tired. Ah, when the grace of God is there, you will not be tired. You will not be weary. And the strength of the Lord will be with you. You'll be consistent as a servant in Jesus' name. You'll be a focused servant. You'll not be a person that is diverted here, diverted here, diverted here. You start a project you cannot finish. No. You're focused. You, you're going through that street. We're touching this house and touching this house and touching this house. And all, this, all these houses remain. You go back there until you finish because you are focused. A focused servant. A purposeful servant. Purposeful servant. When you go out, it's not just to preach. It's to preach so as to have converts. It's not just to pray, it's to pray so as to have results. It's not just to intercede, it's not just to go to night vigil, it's to intercede to have night vigil so that we fulfill this goal. You'll be a consecrated servant, a consecrated servant. But you know, you're going to be a corrigible servant, a servant can, that can easily be corrected. Look at how you did this, you should have done it this way. Look at how that was done, it should have been done this way. If you really love the master, you're not going to grumble because he's uh, correcting you. You take correction. You'll be an improved improving servant. An increasing servant. A growing servant. And then you have increase in your service. Those are the marks of the people that really love the service of the master. And then you'll be an approved commended servant. You'll say well done. It's not even going to wait until the end of the day. But even step by step and week after week is going to be commending your service. Well done. And your service will be appreciated by the Lord. Approved of the Lord. Commended of the Lord in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen there. Yeah. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Reading from verse 14. It says in verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for for all, then were all dead. Then it says, and he and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Did you hear that? I said, Did you hear that? That he died for all, that they which live should tell me out loud, not henceforth live for themselves. Think about your time. Analyze your time. Do you spend much of your time on yourself? Much of your service on yourself? What makes me happy? What gives me a kick? What makes me fulfilled? What makes me appreciated? What makes me like somebody? You're always thinking about yourself. Don't think about yourself again. Because it says, Shall not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died and rose again. Point number three. We're coming to point number three. The permanence of consecrated service. The permanence of consecrated service. It's wonderful when we have people who are consecrated to the work of the Lord committed to the work of the Lord. At any time, day or night, you can call on them. You can depend on them. They never complain. They never look back. They never, they never feel weary. They never feel tired. They never look at you or say, I want to say another thing again. I want to come to me again. I want to put another pressure on me again. I want to cast another vision again. The one we did yesterday, we have not even rested. The other one we did last week, we were still, you know, trying to get back our, our breath. And now we're coming again. No. A servant that loves the master. And he loves him above life. 
And he loves him above everything on earth. And he says, that's my master, the best of masters. And I'm going to serve him. He doesn't complain. He doesn't feel tired or weary. There is permanence, perpetuity. It is consecrated service. And thank God, that's what I see in us who are here. Amen. And I pray that this good quality you have will always be there in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, I used to think, uh, sometimes the trains heavily in the morning. Then we're going to have a Saturday workers' meeting, and then they put the Saturday workers' meeting in a beautiful church like this, but very far from where you are coming from. And then you are driving and driving. You say, where is the place? Should we? Where is should we? Bagada, where is Bagada? I thought when you get over there, you've got to Bagada. And then they say, keep going, keep going. And then you look around. Are we there yet? They say, remain small. And then you move on. And then they say, are we there yet? Keep on moving. And then you go down that way. You come up this way. You go that way. You go that way. You say, are we there yet? They say, keep on moving. And then eventually you see signboard. I say, praise the Lord, we are there. <laughs> but you know, as you are coming like that, long, long journey, and you, find, and you say, are people going to be there? You are wonderful people. Yeah. You are always there. Yeah. You will always be there. Yeah. And when the reward comes, you will be there in Jesus' name. Yeah. When the recognition of heaven comes, you will be there. Yeah. I don't look at those people on that side, people on that side, people on that other side. Everywhere filled up, you are there. Yeah. Miracle comes, you'll be there. Yeah. The power of God comes, you'll be there. Yeah. The approval of heaven comes, you'll be there. Yeah. No matter how far, no matter where it is, we'll be there in Jesus' name. Yeah. We have done well. We're doing well. Let's keep on doing well. And the Lord will meet you at the point of reward in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the permanence of consecrated service. We're coming to Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, and we're reading from verse 6. Exodus chapter 21, verse 6. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. That is when he says, I love my master, I will not go out free. And he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ears through with an awl. That means now your ear is a kind of punctured and your ear is only for the work and for the word of your master. You bear the mark of your master in your ear. No other word, the word of a stranger, the voice of a stranger will not enter your ear again. Now your ear is committed and consecrated only for the word of the master, for the work of the master. And then he shall serve him how long? forever. Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 15 and we're looking at verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 15 reading from verse 17. Then shall thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear unto the door and he shall be thy servant. Tell me forever. He shall be thy servant forever. Also, also unto thy maid servant also the ladies, also the mothers, also the women, also the women servants. It says, thou shalt do likewise. Your ear is now for the word of God. Your ear is now for the work of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 50, and I'm reading from verse 4. In this will become even identical with the Lord Jesus Christ. This prophecy was given concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. It becomes true about us too. Isaiah chapter 50, we're reading from verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned. Amen that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. He'll wake you up. He'll put his word in your ears. Because he says now, have a, you kind of uh, dig a hole in your ear. It says that the Lord God has opened mine ear. Your ears are open. 
I was not rebellious, you'll not be rebellious. Neither turn the way you'll not turn backward. I give my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that pluck up the air. I hid not my face from shame and speeching. Even though the work of God may bring some little insult, assault, persecution, whatever, you are going to be stable in Jesus' name. For the Lord God will help me. The Lord God will help me. The Lord God will help me. Therefore, I shall not be confounded. Therefore, I, shall, I set my face like a flint. He has digged my ears. He has punctured the hole in my ears. He has consecrated my ear only to his word. Therefore, now I'm fixed and focused. And he says, I set my face as a flint. And I know I shall not be ashamed. I know I shall not be ashamed. Forever, 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 you'll keep on serving the Lord. Nothing will turn you back. Nothing will discourage you. Nothing will take this work of God away from your hands. And then on the final day, when the saints go marching in, when the soul winners, the investors, when they go marching in, when the preachers of the gospel, there'll be a special line for them. The people that have served the Lord and the people that have followed the Lord and the people that said, come, rain or sunshine, you'll find me at the place of working for the Lord. At the point the trumpet is sounding, they were busy in the work of the Lord and then the dead, they rise up and those which are alive were caught together with them in the clouds. Thank God you'll be there. I say, thank God you'll be there. Not as a person ashamed because you are lazy. Ashamed because you are footless. Ashamed because you are not having any product, anything in your hand. Meeting the Lord empty-handed. No, you'll not be empty-handed. You don't look like somebody who is going to meet the Lord empty-handed. Where are those hands? Full with the work of God. Productive with the work of God. Successful in the work of the Lord. You'll be a more fruit. I said you'll be a more fruit. And this work of the Lord will prosper in these hands I see in Jesus' name. Now Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God. And they shall serve him day and night in his temple and he shall and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. The Lord has spoken to us again today. He's reminding us that he is the best of masters. You know what? Only the best of servants is good enough for the best of masters. If he is the best of masters, you must be the best of servants. Only the best of laborers is good enough for the best of leaders. is a great leader. A gracious leader. is the best leader you'll ever find. And only the best of laborers is good enough for him. Only the best of gifts is good enough for the best of givers. He's giving himself without reservation. He's giving everything without calculation. He just gave and gave and gave until he gave his life on the cross of Calvary. You're going to bring gifts to him, the gift of your life, the gift of your time, the gift of your skill. Only the best of gifts is good enough for the giver. Only the best of vessels is good enough for the best of virtues. He has the virtue and is the best of virtues. And then you bring your vessel so that you can have this virtue. It says only the best of vessels is good enough for the best of virtues. Only the best of messengers 
is good enough for the best of masters. It's giving us the word. It's giving us the message. And then you prepare yourself as the best of messengers. That you are in the best condition. And you are in the best spiritually. You are best in the best spiritual condition. And then you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I offer this to you. In the best position, attitude, I can put myself. Because only the best of messengers is good enough for the best of masters. Only the best of treasures is good enough for the best of teachers. This, the teacher come from heaven. And now you bring yourself as a treasure to take part in this ministry that he has raised up. Only the best of treasures will be good enough for the best of teachers. Only the best service will be good enough to announce the best sacrifice that he gave on the cross of Calvary. Only the best commitment is good enough for Christ, the best of captains. And he asks us again today, lovest thou me more than everything on earth? And say, yes, Lord, I love you. Say, then come, give me your best. And begin today and continue from today to serve the best of masters. Lord, we'll do it. Amen. We can do it. Amen. We must do it. Amen. We don't have any other assignment. People say we're peculiar. That's what we are. We're peculiar. In serving the Lord, we'll serve the Lord every moment of the best of what we are. Because he is the best of masters. Rise up and tell the Lord today, I commit my life once again. I commit myself once again. Only the best is good enough for him. The best of masters, the best of teachers, the best of captains, the best of leaders, the best of givers. And I come to present myself. I give the very best unto my Lord.